Hello and welcome to No Sweat in a year that keeps getting crazier and crazier. My name is Luca and I'm joined today by our footy insider at Top 4 next year. Hello, Jim. G'day, mate. How are you? Very good. And hello, Dodd. Luke, how are you? Excellent. Just gotten better. I've gotten better because this week our lawyers have gotten to work. Pen has been put to paper and the man has returned. Welcome back to JD. Well, boys, look, I want to say it's good to be back, but frankly, I was never off the job. I'm a man of the people. I was hitting the streets, maintaining my 1.5 meter distance um, and just sort of getting a very sort of feel for the pulse of the nation um, with regards to footy. And I got to say that I think the general consensus, No Sweat Podcast, is a Kai Bosch podcast. Allow me to elaborate, gentlemen. I think uh, it might have been two weeks ago we had our GWS. We said they were going to go basically undefeated. Since we made that prediction, GWS haven't won. I think we said Gold Coast would go completely uh, winless for the season. Gold Coast haven't lost. (laughs) I think we had Buddy Franklin pegged for a big season. Hasn't played a game. Our up-and-comers, Will Haywood. Six disposals on the weekend. Our other up-and-comer, Darcy Fogarty, six disposals on the weekend. (laughs) Our other up-and-comer, Nick Larkey, hasn't played a game this season. And the might of Ben Cunnington has been injured and is completely flat. So, look, I've got seven. I think I've missed a couple as well. But the consensus from the people on the street on my week in absence from this podcast has revealed plainly that. So my up-and-comer, the only one that did okay, Jade Grisham? So yeah, we, should look to, we should look to TFNY for all the answers. That's exactly it. Look, I think the, look at least three out of the four of us, I'm excluding myself there obviously, are expert analysts of the game. Uh, but look, I think it's harder to get all of those wrong than it is to right. So I think that actually elevates her expert status irrespective. <laughs> yeah, John, we're going down the David King path. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And with that being said... The No Sweat podcast is crazy, but not as crazy as football actually is. Before we get stuck into the weekend's matches, though, quick news off the top that's been announced today. Good news. Crowds will be back at footy this week. Last week, we got around the showdown when they had 2,000 people there. As from this weekend, crowds are allowed at 50% capacity in Western Australia. The downside is that there won't be any matches there. So when the AFL does the next round of draws. Hopefully there'll be some games in Perth and they'll be able to capitalize on that. The even better news is that July 18th, which should align with some footy being played in WA, they will be able to have 100% capacity. So great news there. People will be at the footy in WA. And this weekend as well in Queensland, we'll be having 10K at the Gabba and Metricon. It's 25% capacity. So whatever 25% of Metricon would be. There we go. So great news. But obviously the other big piece of news this week is the Essendon versus Melbourne game, which got postponed on Sunday. A man Jim was meant to be sideline at the MCG on Sunday. Obviously he couldn't get there because there was no game. Connor McKenna returning with a positive COVID test on Saturday morning. Alleged positive test, I think is the uh, current consensus. Alleged, yes. There's some doubt about that today. Jim, what's your uh, read on the situation? What do you think about how this has gone down? Well, I don't want to get too bogged down in the news specific per se because it's been done to death over the last couple of days. He returned the irregularity, then got tested again and was tested positive. So we're just going to have a look at what that actually means moving forward. So most likely scenario is going to be that Essendon will play Carlton and all the close contacts with McKenna will have to quarantine. So that means a few other of Essendon's big defenders. So a quick list of who will most likely have to quarantine or isolate themselves for 14 days will be Michael Hurley, Hooker, Saad, Ridley, Gleeson and Guelphy alongside McKenna himself. So it's obviously something that's a bit strange. You would think the club actually putting all the big defenders, all the other general defenders in the same training group. And I thought that was a bit strange until I looked into it and then I realized that Melbourne, West Coast, obviously Essendon and Richmond and Carlton, to name a few, have also trained uh, in the traditional positional groups. So you would think if the situation that we're going to be having now would have ha- like obviously happened, you would have mixed up your players and all that sort of stuff. But it's actually not that commonplace in the AFL. Few few teams are actually doing it. Um, and Melbourne in particular have said that they're 
have publicly said that they that they will continue to train in their positional groups. So if those players are all wiped out, well, what do we think that the Essendon defense facing Carlton would look like? Well, having a quick look, I've put back I've put my back six together. So I've got Redmond, Ambrose, Francis, McGrath, unfortunately moving back into the halfback line. Brandon Zerk Thatcher and Cutler, who I've been told can play pretty well off the halfback flank. Um, we could probably see Dylan Clark coming back into the side and going back into the forward line, potentially playing a forward tag role. So, for example, Essendon's versus Carlton, it could potentially be that Clark gets the job on bets. That might be a bit interesting. Ooh. Look, it doesn't look like the end of the world for Essendon. Obviously, they're going to be losing a few players, but they just have to make do. Theoretically, hypothetically, looking into the future, they should still belt the Blues, to be honest with you. <laughs> they don't really have a solid forward line, to be honest. Um, Whack. Oh. The main concern for SN supporters probably be the Collingwood game. So this one's scheduled 13 days after Sunday. So two days ago, or yesterday at the time of recording. So that's 13 days. So that just misses short. So you would assume that all who should be isolating have already begun to do so. And surely the AFL moves that game to coincide. So that's normally supposed to be a Friday night game against Collingwood. I'm, I'm expecting them to move it to Sunday. And also... What could replace the Sunday game? Uh, replace the Friday game is something that I'm a bit high on, and I know we'll talk about it uh, in the podcast. But it's something that might might be worth experimenting. Should we put the Gold Coast versus Geelong game on the Friday night? Did the Gold Coast deserve to have that prime time feature after the last couple of weeks? Gold Coast no. might deserve it, but Geelong sure as hell don't. <laughs> <laughs> Can I can I just ask a question here? I guess slightly off topic. Well, not off topic. On the McKenna aspect, so you mentioned the backline group was going to be isolated, and this might be from my lack of knowledge from the coronavirus gestation period. But they played how many days before against Sydney? So isn't there a the- well, they played last Sunday? So is there a theoretical chance of infection, or is that sort of passed in that period? Well, the good news of this is that the players are getting tested twice a week. So earlier in the week, he passed without any issues and it was his Friday test that showed an irregularity, which was then confirmed on Saturday that he was tested positive. So there wouldn't be any issues from the week prior because he passed the test. I believe it was Monday during the week. Okay. And that gives the three or four days or whatever it is for that period of unknown. Okay. Yeah. And just to add to the confusion now, so we can publicly say at time of recording, it's about five o'clock Monday time and seven, Channel 7 have released a report saying that there's inquiries being made about a potential false positive wow. test. So it may be unlikely, but could you imagine a scenario where it comes out that everything, including this test is negative? This has got more drama than the Russian athletic saga from a couple <laughs> of years back. <laughs> this is incredible. And this might be the second time this decade where the Bombers have been accused of testing positive for something, but it turns out that they did not test positive at all. Juicy. Let's not go down that path. Boys, a lot of talk today on SEN. There was a few old heads that called up today. The same blokes that think that footy sucks now and that players aren't skilled and they're just angry at life. And there were some serious opinions today. They they were thinking McKenna should be suspended for the season. Some blokes said he should be deported back to (laughs) Ireland. Uh, what do you boys think? What, what's a fair suspension for this? Because there's still a lot in the air about what exactly he did wrong because the protocol thing's been a bit confusing with, because apparently you can have an inspection if you own a house. Um, but if you're looking for a rental, apparently there's a bit of a, a black hole there. But what do you boys think is a fair suspension for that? Well, as we know, the AFL do like to adjudicate based on the outcome and not the action, as we've spoken about last week. So, for example, Connor McKenna here, he gets the coronavirus. Well, then they're more likely going to be dealing with him more harshly than someone, say, like Zerk Thatcher or your Ollie Wines, who still broke the protocols but didn't actually get it or pass it on to anyone, which I think we all would say is unfair. Like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't actually tick their boxes. So, going back into what you were saying about the grey area, um, there is actually a bit that has come out today um, sort of talking about that. So quoting the age directly here. So it's not my interpretation. Meanwhile, McKenna, whose lease on the house he lives in is coming up, has admitted he went to a house inspection on Wednesday. Under the AFL's guidelines, which are stricter than the rules imposed on members of the general public, players are allowed to move house, brackets, including house inspection if selling. The guidelines do not specify the rules about inspections for those who are renting. So I think that's what you were referring to before, Dodd. So it was the only thing that he did wrong 
um, be visiting his family? Yeah, the the open for inspection wasn't as much of an issue because realistically you're only going to cross over with a real estate agent there anyway. So it's only one person that's in the loop. But the bigger issue was him going against club advice and going to visit what they're calling family but isn't his blood family. It's his host family from when he first moved here and friends. So the AFL's instituted these rules here saying while the coronavirus pandemic is around, you can't do X, Y, and Z and all of these things that they've listed, including which is visiting people that aren't part of the AFL system. So up until last week, they weren't allowed to visit anybody that wasn't part of the AFL system. Those laws were then slightly relaxed, but McKenna still went against explicit club advice and AFL laws by doing these things. Now, if he doesn't have the virus, it's against the AFL's policy, but it's not doing any harm to anybody. Now we find out he tests positive, which is still yet to be reconfirmed. But if he was infectious when he visited these people, it could be hundreds, if not thousands of people that are indirectly. Oh, that's a, that's a, well, we, yeah, we know how, we, we know how infections happen. That, that's a bit fair to whack that all on That's a big him. reach. It's a Hang on, big can I just finish yeah, my point? Hang on, Luke. So what you're saying is that we're going to pin the potential infection of thousands on McKenna and we're going to punish him accordingly to the AFL standard based on innuendo and no fact whatsoever. So can I just clarify, has he actually broken a law? Like an Australian law? An Australian law. The law dictated by the government. I wouldn't say so. Okay. So he's free on that remark. Has he broken an AFL law? Potentially, but based off... No, yes. Clearly, well, yes. Based off, okay. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was listening to Jared Waitley this morning and he said that as of... Last Tuesday, players are able to meet with family. Yeah, mm. but not friends, and they're not technically his family. So oh, regardless, it doesn't count. There's a bit of gray area there. This is yeah. This is what I hate. I, I heard on Dwayne's um, SEN this morning, oh, this afternoon. He was saying like the family technicality. Like you could catch up with an uncle that you hate, and you haven't seen in four years. But like you're the, the people who are uh, not blood family, but feel like family to you. You can't see, and I think for this guy, he's from a different country. And he's being thrashed because he's visiting his his foster family. Like people just need to get off the high horse a bit, I think. Yeah. yeah so he's come to this country with no family. He's got no family here. Is that correct? They've just the clubs brought him over. Yeah. 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 So okay. So that's fair enough. He's going to have people that are going to feel like family. So just going back. So let's say he has broken an AFL law. Surely the AFL has already thought through the punishment that if someone does breach the terms, there should be something imposed. If they haven't, then this is just classic case of the AFL's negligence to be able to explain the rules correctly. Yeah, so that before all this started, the way that they publicly said that they were going to offici- officiate sort of COVID breaches was going to be decided against similar to what the MRP has. So when they're deciding a bump against a player, they're going to be looking at if it's careless, reckless, intentional. But under that model, who knows what he can get? It, you could argue yeah. that they're all... It's all careless. You, can, you could argue that it's intentional or reckless or not for both of them. It sounds like they're making it up on the fly. I just want to clarify. I don't think Conor McKenna has done anything bad from him. He did it without knowing that he was sick, we assume, because he was asymptomatic. So he's not to know that he's potentially putting people at risk, but this is why the AFL has instituted those rules around not visiting people while the players are playing football now. It's to protect people if they are infectious. Even though he didn't know he was infectious, this is why the rules are there. It's to avoid any risk. Yeah, I just my only counter to that, Luke, is this pandemic, it's new for everyone. Um, we've had a few things now, a few players have breached protocol, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep happening throughout the season. If it was any of us boys, we probably would have breached it by now, to be honest. like It's human for us to want to um, see our family. So I, I just think that the the constant attacking of Connor today, which I heard all day on SEN. I just think it's it's just too much. The boys. human aspect you could apply to it based on whether you give five weeks, six weeks suspension. I'm not calling for that, but the human element can't be um, used on whether or not he actually broke a law. And if the laws were relaxed or the, I'm talking about the AFL laws, if the AFL guidelines and COVID um, 
protocols were eased, then it's not really Connor's fault if he was just doing what he did. The gray area comes from him visiting his host family. And I'm sure you could argue for someone who has homesickness like he does, like these are close to his real parents. Like they've brought him in. He's been here for a few years now. It, there is a certain connection there. I think, I don't know if we want to delve that far into it, but would step parents be considered appropriate family for people to go and visit? If they are, then why not? I think so. If they're not, if they are, then why not? 100%. Te- not technical legal guardians such as his, like his current foster parents or host parents, but it's they're surely the same principle to be applied. Yeah, I think it's a shame that it was McKenna himself that tested positive. If it was anybody else, I don't think it would be as big of an issue, especially considering the rumors that were coming out saying he didn't want to be playing football much longer potentially. It's a shame that's him where his family have the question marks around, uh, do we consider them family, et cetera, et cetera. But Ultimately, I think the AFL needs to impose some kind of sentence just to prove how strict and how serious this really is. It's not against him as an individual, but it's just to say, this is serious. You need to respect the laws. I'm saying he gets a week. I think a week's fair. Even two, just for isolation's sake. <laughs> but people are saying that he should get a se- should get the season. I- admittedly, I'm an Essendon supporter. That's way too harsh. First of all, we've just decided that there's clear clear gray area whether he actually breached an AFL protocol. Um, you've got precedents prior to people that have actually broken the protocols and have gotten one week. So you'd be if you give him one to two weeks, you're really giving him the sanction based on a um, on a positive test result. And that's you take safeguards to not have that, but it's not his fault per se. Another big talking point from this uh, scenario the last few days, boys, is the postponement of Essendon versus Melbourne. A lot of talk whether Melbourne deserve the four points. What do you guys think? I think personally that that's ridiculous. <laughs> I think the game will just be postponed. They'll play and it's, it's unlucky for Melbourne a little bit, but the AFL and the teams know that this season, it's going to be a bit of, it's going to happen again. Games are going to be postponed again because another player will contra- contract the virus, I think. So all these Melbourne fans calling up SEN today saying, you know, I'm not biased, but as a Melbourne supporter, I think we should get the four points. But come on, turn it up. Like, that's ridiculous. I hope you boys are, what do you boys think? No, Melbourne are clearly the biggest victim in this because they've done everything right and their game's been delayed and they might have another game with a short turnaround in the future. We still don't know the clarity of when their next games, or sorry, when the rematch will be played or the postponed game. But giving them four points for this is ridiculous. They're still going to replay the game. There's no point even considering that as an option, surely. I think Melbourne should just be grateful they got the four points against Carlton the week before because they, they were shocking after quarter <laughs> I think they're time. just using this as something that they, they know that they're not going to be winning a few games this year. So they just want to take four point four points when they can get it. <laughs> yeah, well, what, this is typical Melbourne. What, what happens if... So just say, just to go on that, art, on that vein quickly, if there was something like this to happen again, you would expect another four points awarded? Well, first, you're just giving out points for nothing, further devaluing the season. Second of all, what happens if it's a grand final? Well, you're going to award a premier based off someone getting coronavirus. That's that's absolutely ridiculous. And I don't think that should even be mentioned because it's so crazy to even think mm-hmm. about it. Just quickly, the last point on this. We all follow multiple sports here. So we all follow a few American sports. We know what the coronavirus and COVID has done to the NBA. So I think the first, I think it was the first, Dodd, correct me if I'm wrong, Rudy Gobert, first player. To get it? Yeah, yeah. first confirmed So case, I yeah. just hope that this doesn't have a bit of um, Rudy Gobert and um, Donovan Mitchell about this. So as we know, so the situation with Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell was pretty much where he had it, Rudy, and he was going around doing other things, so like touching microphones, all that sort of stuff, being a bit careless. Um, and then his other teammates, so especially Donovan Mitchell, also contracted it and they felt a bit slighted and a bit annoyed in particular, obviously Donovan Mitchell, where it almost caused a massive rift in the jazz team, almost turning it to go getting traded or asking for a trade. I just really hope that there doesn't, ha- like that doesn't appear with the bombers here. Cause so could you imagine how put your, put yourself in hurl your hooker's feet. If you've got a player who's got it and then come to training, gone broken the rules technically or gray area early, if that makes sense. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> I just hope that there's not a rift there that develops from these two or the like McKenna and another player. Um, that kind of animosity would be shocking for the Bombers. Yeah, I think in this scenario, it should be all right. If he was doing something really dodgy, like, well, I actually don't know, but, <laughs> you know, not inspecting a house or, you know, he's doing something illegally or something very shifty, I think then you'd have grounds to be upset. But 
I think those players as well, if, if we have empathy for him, his own teammates will for sure. All right, moving on to games that were actually played. Starting from Thursday night, we have Richmond versus Hawthorne. How did you see that game, Dodds? Doesn't that, that game feel like it was a few weeks ago already? Just so much has happened <laughs> since yeah. Thursday night. Um, I don't even remember the game, to be honest. I had a few beers, but no, no it was... Good. It was, uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> oh, hey, hey. Uh, no swear podcast is not condone uh, drinking of alcohol beyond excess. Drink responsibly. <laughs> nah, I, I, was, uh, I was pretty happy to see the Hawks bounce back, boys, as a biased Hawthorne supporter, as you know. But um, I think the standout, uh, the th- few things that stood out for me, boys, was Jago Mira coming back after missing the game against Geelong. Um, just he adds that, that balance to the midfield with Tom Mitchell and Warple. Um, he, was, he was clean. Um, he had the ball 16 times in the first half. At 100% efficiency, lads. Can't, can't nice. complain with that at all. But yeah, he just adds a bit of polish to the Hawks midfield. And yeah, he could really see it at the start. The Hawks just came out with some serious intent. They were very disappointed after last week's effort against Geelong in that second half. It's not often that Clarko's teams get smashed like that. So you knew they were going to come out hard. But I think the talking point from this game was Richmond, boys. Um, very disappointing because you got to know that Hawthorne we're trying to bounce back after that game. And they had nine tackles in the first half. And you could just see the effort from the Tigers was not there. But yeah, I think the Tigers now, they're one, one and one after their draw last week um, to the Pies. I don't know if it's time to panic yet because this time last year, they were one and two and they lost back-to-back games to the Giants and Collingwood by over 40 points. So it's only, it's only a couple of games, but... I would be a little bit worried, but I don't think it's time to panic. What do you boys think? Well, I think serious questions need to start being asked of Richmond's forward line, to be honest. Well, how can you dish up 36 last week, 39 this week against two of your rivals that might be in finals with you? Mm. Jack Rewa looks all out of sorts, to be honest. He looks shot, looks slow. Terrible. um, Can't really take a mark. He's just having no real impact. Um, Tom Lynch missing out, fr- missing from eight meters out. Oh, come on, that, that was, you can't do that. That's the worst thing with it. <laughs> that could be worse than Josh Bruce is running into an open goal. Um, well, what are they going to do? Where are their goals going to come from? I was surprised they didn't get Ark to review that because that was that was terrible, boys. That was I don't know what's going on. It's interesting. I heard a stat on SEN today: the six um, leading goal kickers this year are all small forwards. So there's been a few out of mm. form big guys and Jack Rewalt's definitely one of them as you mentioned James you can't rely on Castagna to kick all your goals I'll just leave, I'll leave that there yeah just so just quick before we go off this game 42 free kicks were paid for that game for a shortened game that's too much that's too much it felt very stop start and I didn't realize at the time why but then I, have, I was having a look at the stats yeah 42 yeah, there's been a few, um, I think the first three games this week as well, every game got over 40 free kicks combined. So those shortened quarters, but the free kicks are going higher. So a little bit of a worry there. I think the uh, little guys are just getting a bit hungry to blow that whistle. It's been a while, James. <laughs> <laughs> the pandemic uh, held them out of it. <laughs> just on that though, like I've always been a bit skeptical about the total number, but were they actually there from your, like, you know, just the eye test, if you will? Or did it seem like there was some sort of ticky touch wood kind of freeze that just slowed it down I think there could have been a few that they let go yeah okay and a lot not a lot but a few were coming from the ruck contest and I've noticed that that's actually a theme throughout the weekend where there's contests in the ruck where I don't think there should have been um, like a free kick given but there was I think they're really targeting and clamping down on that okay fair enough get rid of it all right, so that ended up being a pretty convincing win for the Hawks. On to Friday night where we had the Doggies hosting GWS. That's you, Jim. Yeah, so we have the newest rivalry in the AFL. One of the most intense as well, you could say. And that started real early. The Dogs ran out victors, but it was spot fires from get the word go. Um, the Giants were clearly attacking Bont and Pally. And something I didn't realize, but both captains, Bont, Canelio, they're both Italians. Two Italian captains. How good's that? That's pretty good. That's nice. So 70, <laughs> 75% of this podcast host have Italian heritage. So I thought that would be good to mention because I didn't realize I, I should have Bontem Pally and Canelio. Anyway, 
Um, I think it started real weird real early when Canelio sent Haynes into the coin toss. So that's been doing the rounds recently. Mm. So that was a few mind games. Um, obviously trying to get back at Bont for breaking Haynes' larynx uh, in last year. I think Jedi West came into the game thinking like if they play tough, the dogs will just roll over again um, like they have the last couple of games. Um, but the dogs, to their credit, they actually came out and played how we asked them to last week. Um, we asked them to come out strong and show a bit of heart. Um, gee whiz, they, sh- they shut down the Giants real quick, didn't they? Another thing I took out of the game is that goal kicking at the moment, it's becoming a bit of a disgrace. Um, you, there's just too many, it's just too often where shots are just missing and just not even getting close to the goals. And the crowd can no longer be used as a factor, I've noticed, because why? Well, there's no crowds. It's, <laughs> it's, obvious, it's just shocking to look at. The Bulldogs half-back line just did not, not let anything get past them. They didn't let anything get to them uncontested as well, which obviously puts the pressure on because every time Jedi Boys were kicking it forward, they were kicking it to a contest. There was just no free-flowing from the Giants, which I thought was a real tick for the Bulldogs' pressure and their um, constant attack on the ball and constant attack on the ball carrier. All in all, I'm just really happy that the dogs actually did what we asked. I'm sure Bevo is listening to us and he's instilling a bit of um, bit of confidence in the boys <laughs> to go hard at the footy. The Giants came out and acted as the bully, but they got bullied. And it's disapp- two weeks in a row for the Giants that have had some seriously bad losses. And there's just one thing that it's been a bit of a theme I've noticed in recent years. When they, they're not at full strength, so they had Toby Green out, Whitfield went down early with a concussion. I think they had another out. But it seems like the Giants, compared to any other club in the in the AFL, they can't win unless they're fully healthy. And there's a lot of ex- when they lose, it's always that they're not fully healthy. I don't know if you boys are noticing a pattern here, but I think the, the great clubs, your Collingwoods or your Richmonds, recent years, they can get up with some serious injuries. But the Giants, I don't know what it is, but they, I think they depend too much on their class, their skill, but their their effort hasn't been great these last few weeks. To be honest, it always feels like Jedi West have players out and it feels like they have always been playing with players injured. So if you just go back to last year, I'm, I'm not going to say I agree with your point, but last year in the prelim, who didn't they have? Well, they didn't have, they didn't have Canelio. They didn't have Green. Pretty sure, with, no, Whitfield was fine. Um, so they didn't have, yeah, no Ward. They've always having these injuries. And I think I'm... I'm not one that's going to actually blame the injuries for them losing this game. I think they came out with the mentality to hurt the dogs and they forgot that they're actually there to play football. They put the the intensity and the aggression on top of winning the ball. And if you go into a game like that, you're obviously not going to be focusing on the footy. And if the dogs aren't focusing on that, if they're still tough, I'm not saying that the Bulldogs weren't tough, but if they're focusing mainly on playing footy, I think they're gonna they're gonna always be in a better position to win. And sorry, we're talking about Nick Haynes. It didn't make mm. sense that he went there. There was no reason for more retribution for the broken larynx. That game had already been retributed in the elimination final last year when GWS smacked the dogs. So I don't know why he would keep going with that. I don't know. Phil Davis said in the post-match that it was because Cornelia wants to instill leadership in other players. And we all know that's crap. <laughs> so for them to do that and play those mind games from the start, it was just cheap. It just mm. felt real cheap. Yeah, I, I agree. And the way they came out, I don't, I don't mind that if they can back it up and get the win. But if you're going to do that and then be out toughed by that doggy team, you're going to cop it this week and, and they deserve it, frankly. Do you think GWS had just gone into this season a little bit too cocky in the sense of, so you mentioned the injuries. I think it's very easy to pick injuries when you've got a team as stacked for quality as they do. So it's nearly natural that the injuries are going to be quality names when they've got a team that's star-studded. They got hammered last year in the grand final. Do you think there's nearly this expectation that they're, they're just going to naturally take that next step? Because everyone's sort of saying, oh, they'll come out hungrier and play all those sort of cliches and what have you. And it just hasn't worked. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to a bit before. I, I, th- I think we all agree that the Giants probably have the most talented list in the league. Do, do we all agree yeah. on that? Yep. Yeah. So... This year... Or oh, other than Gold Coast. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Yeah, Matty Rao. Besides Matty Rao, <laughs> um, which we'll get to later. But th- this is their time. Last year, you know, they got smashed in the granny. But this year, <laughs> the No Sweat podcast gave them undefeated season. And 
this talented list, they're going to have to prove something this year. And whether they have injuries or not, they still got enough talent overall to win games. Look at Richmond's two premierships the last three years. Do we agree that their, their list hasn't been... Like, it's, it's been a good list, but they, they play above and beyond their talent. They play, yeah, they yeah. play the right yeah. way. And I think the Giants this year are going to have to do that and get a bit tougher. Yeah, good assessment. To answer your question, John, no, I don't think they're cocky. Okay. But they do need to work harder. Yes. And that's obvious. But I think they know that now-ish, but they need to keep going. Yeah. Just a quick shout out to Bailey Smith, boys. Another great performance from him. And he had one of the greatest quotes um, after the game. We, we've noticed the hair and uh, he cuts his own hair. He says he, he can't cut the back. I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> he, he reckons he can't cut the back because he doesn't know how to do it. So he, he's a good lad. He's playing great. And last year's AFL draft is looking very stacked at the top there. There's some serious talent and doggies have a great one in Bailey Smith. You've got to love him even if you don't support them. I've been cutting my, cutting my hair for years, boys. I don't get the same recognition, but anyways. <laughs> also, shout out to Jack McRae. 25 touches. It shows what happens when you put a midfielder in the midfield. <laughs> I think Bevo was definitely listened, listening to our podcast last week, James. Yeah, it was a good response from the doggies as opposed to last week. Not so good of a response though. Early Saturday, JD. Your men at North couldn't get it done against the Swans. Oh, I'm going to be very uh, non-biased about this um, for a change. Um, look, it was a heavily contested <laughs> game. Funnily enough, like there was, I think at one point there was a 33-point deficit in the Swans' direction. It watching the game though, it didn't feel like a 33-point shellacking. And I, uh, I think uh, Jim, you mentioned it earlier. It was purely down to the goal kicking. North really not taking uh, hold of a lot of their chances. So many easy misses, set shots. Um, that you know, fairly reliable kicks normally should have put away. Um, and as a result, they had to claw back in the final stages of the game and did get to within 11 points, which is uh, admirable, but there's no such thing as an admirable loss. A loss is a loss. So the final score there ending 60 to 71. Um, shout out to two players in particular. Uh, one being a North one, Jai Simpkin, and the other one being uh, Ollie Florent. And the reason being, uh, both these guys had come out of the same draft. I think one was pick uh, 13 and one was 14, so side by side. Um, Ollie Florent mm-hmm. actually picked up uh, MVP for the All-Stars match. Two very, very, pre- what's the word? Prestigious? Let's go with that. Prodigious, whatever it is. They're good <laughs> young talents. Um, and it's good to see. I think both of them really taking a step up. So, for instance, Jai Simpkin, he hasn't had a bad game this season. I think he topped uh, 140 for the Super Coach boys and 26 disposals, um, topping the uh, disposal count for the game. So it was a fairly low disposal count across both teams, sort of suggesting that contested style that it was. Um, and Oli Florent right there with 22. Um, and, yeah, sort of solid around the ground as that outlet. Yeah, I'm with you with the Jai Simpkin call. Yeah, as you said, he hasn't had a bad game this year. and. I can see that they uh, Reece Shaw is playing him more in the guts. Yep. So he's also added five clearances as well. And if I'm looking at his possession heat map, he is red around the center circle. So that just shows that they are having plans on moving him into the midfield. And that does bode well because he is a very good player. Yeah, it does. Look, he, first season he had that broken leg that it was coming in um, or off in. Um, and he did. Like he could barely kick 35 meters originally. Um, but as times progress, he's got a bit more, bit more weight on the uh, weight on the body, uh, a bit more confidence in the leg, and he's doing very, very well. A bit of a sad story, I guess, for uh, McCartan um, concussed again. I, I don't want to say it's genetic, but these boys seem to be soft skulled. Um, it's actually really sad. So in a marking contest, head hit the ground and wasn't in a good state. Um, so yeah, hope he's all uh, all okay. But it is bizarre that you got two McCartan boys, both who really suffer quite easily. Um, from the concussion aspect, so mm. a little bit of a, a downer from a from a solid game. Uh, nonetheless, entertaining, congested. I guess a lot of those, look, North Sydney, they both play that kind of style, highly defensive, um, and it was sort of the whole master-apprentice aspect of uh, Reece Shaw and Longmire. However, I don't think Reece Shaw was outcoached. I think he was purely the players didn't execute um, properly and in return gave Sydney a lovely, lovely little win. So, no, good, full credit to them. Um, deserved North did not take their chances, but entertaining enough. Yeah, I want to quickly mention a few players on this game. Just quickly, Todd Goldstein, two back-to-back dominant performances. 
even though North lost this week, he was really, really good again. And I think Sydney can be really happy with a, their midfield, but also Tom Papley up forward has continued his form really well and worked his way up the Coleman with another couple of goals this week. So good signs there for the Swans. Moving into Saturday afternoon then, uh, Collingwood versus the Saints, that's you, Jim. Yes, and this one was a bit of an eyesore, if I'm going to be honest. I've found that the game was largely an unimpressive contest. One real standout player would have been side bottom. 31 touches, six, tack- six tackles, six score involvements. He had a lot of uncont- uncontested touches off um, left half back flank. Um, real clean. Yeah, it actually really impressed me for not the first time in his career. I had a quick assessment at, at quarter time. Uh, I posted up on TFMY about what I thought was going to be happening after quarter time. And well, not to toot my own horn, but it sort of came true. So pretty much I'll read it word <laughs> for word. I said, I reckon this match has the potential to get ugly if the Saints don't fix the following issues. They're too sloppy going forward, almost being too rushed, and they almost don't seem to be breaking a sweat defensively while putting pressure on the pies forwards. Now, they were going forward real... They almost seemed as if they were rushing, playing on when they shouldn't have, and they were just bombing inside 50. They must have thought that there was four Nick Rewalts there, but they only found one (laughs) king. Um, And also on on defense... (laughs) for when the Pies were forward. Stevenson was running laps around whoever was on him. It didn't really matter at the time. They just didn't look like they were trying hard enough. And I think that's a common theme. If you try, you're going to win. And Stevenson was just running rings around everyone. A good return to football for him. And um, I think two goals in the end. But yeah, the Saints defenders need to really work their butts off next game. Yeah, I think this speaks levels to the evenness of the competition this year where... Last week, St. Kilda used the ball brilliantly and they were intense. This week, they were the opposite. The Doggies were terrible against St. Kilda and they delivered a really good performance this week. It looks like anybody can win any week now, which is you just need to show up, be intense, win the footy and you've got a chance. Also, just a quick shout out to Collingwood's defense. Um, They've let up 36 last week and now 37 this week against the Saints. Um, Just goes to show how on or becoming elite, Maynard above average at the moment, pushing the next. Very good. Next, Yeah, very good. And who's that? Oh, Darcy Moore, who's I also think is at the elite status as well. So kudos to the defense. Collingwood could have a few um, All-Australians in the back line there with Darcy Moore, Chris Maynard to be pushing it for this year. And Jeremy yeah, Chris Howell as well. As well. Their, their defense is stacked and, I'm high on the Pies, boys. They're looking good. Trelaw's yet to come back as well. But I think they've got a good mix of the older guys and these younger kids coming through as well. They've just got a perfect list. And quick shout out to Josh Dacos and uh, Tyler Brown as well. Two young young fellas playing a few games now. And they're, they're looking very comfortable in the uh, black and white uniform and not the power uniform. It frustrates <laughs> me knowing that them two are brothers. They look identical and they're both really promising real early. It just frustrates me. Because they play for Collingwood. What frustrates me with Collingwood now is I don't really hate any of their players. Like you want to hate Collingwood so bad, but this this team at the moment, you just, I, I love them more, to be honest. <laughs> you can't not hate Maynard and Elliot. Come on, they're the rudest lids in the world. You just want to belt them. Maynard's got a lid on him for sure, but <laughs> hearing him, uh, the way he talks um, off the ground as well, he's, he's a bit of a leader there at the Pies and he's one that I, I misjudge. He, he could be a future captain. They're very high on him. So, yeah, Pies are looking very strong this year, boys. So consistent at the moment. I'm also not too high on Dugowie's personality, but we'll save that one for another pod. Future captain, Jim. Future <laughs> captain. <laughs> All right, on to the big Saturday night game in Geelong, which ended up being a bit of a thriller, really. Carlton holding on by two points after dominating the majority of this game. I breathe a sigh of relief now. The Blues are finally on the board. And this week was a bit of a reverse of last week's fixture for Carlton. They ended up starting off really, really well and trailed off at the end. But the first half in particular, Carlton probably used the ball better than almost any team I've seen out of the back half of the first half. Not sure if it was a sign of Geelong's lack of pressure and Geelong just being off, but the Blues kicked really well. They were composed and the ball use into 50 was excellent. Particularly early on, Carlton's forwards just took off 
Um, the spread of goal kickers was fantastic. Casbolt kicked two, Mitch McGovern kicked two, Harry McKay kicked one, but could have had more. So without Charlie Kerno, the Blues forward line still doing its job really well. Moving on to another forward that I think was a really key part on this game as well, Eddie Betts. Everyone's spoken about it, but he was obviously the victim of some pretty bad racial abuse last week. And the Blues grouped together really strongly to fight against that. And Eddie's performance this week was fantastic. He was so exciting. Kicked the first goal of the game. Didn't have a lot of the ball, 12 touches, but he was always buzzing. Some smothers, some tackles. Ended up with two goals. And what was essentially the match-winning tackle late on Jack Henry to win the Carlton back the ball with about 30 seconds left to go. So good on Eddie Betts. Great to have him back in the Navy blue and great to see him singing in the middle of the song. Another superstar at the Blues, Paddy Cripps. Excellent again this week. 24 touches, two goals. Spent a fair bit of time forward, but when it mattered, he really stood up, impacted this game, always around the ball. On the other side of things, though, Geelong were not good. Uh, Chris Scott, after the game, said they have problems and they were a bit of a mess. The only really highlight, I suppose, Gary Rowan, two goals, one, strong marking, good contest. Pretty much Geelong's only bright light from this game. Mark Pitnett, boys, had a, another impressive um, performance. and The flying French Italian man. Oh, baguette and salami. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had a ripper game, boys. And Stanley was huge last week against the Hawks. And he, he matched up very well um, against him this week. And it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when Cruz is back. Will Cruz slide straight back into the team? Or do you think the flying Frenchman, Luca, do you reckon he's going to hold his spot in the, in the side? I think if Cruz is fit, he's a walk-up start. The Blues rate him so highly. The issue is just he can't string it together. Even still now, Luke? Yeah. Walk-up? Yep. Ooh. Oh, yep. Be yeah. No question. If, he's, if Cruz is fit, Cruiser plays. But the question is if he's fit. And I think Pitnet's still probably the third-rated Ruckman at the Blues because they really oh. like Tommy DeConning. He's a young kid coming up. He's he young, young. was though. injured as well, but... Uh, the Blues rate him really highly also. So I think he would have even played last week if he was fit uh, instead of Pitnett. But you're right, Pitnett's been really good two weeks in a row. He was, again, around the ground, so contested this week, getting amongst everything. And he won a lot of hit-outs this week too. Pitnett himself, though, he's not an old person by any stretch. He's 24. Why couldn't he be the project? Mm. Why is Tom declining the project? And why why is he above him in the pecking order? I don't think, I think the last thing Carlton would actually want is a young bloke who's going to get absolutely beaten up physically in the ruck, considering the rest of their team. So I think Pitnett sort of suits that. He's an yeah, unintelligent ruckman, if you want to call it that, from a tap craft <laughs> perspective. Um, but he's got the physical presence, um, sort of that Munford esque, if you want to call it that, without the kilos and the muscle and the aggression and sausages. Um, but he sort of fits maybe perhaps more that line. So I think he's okay. Look, I think Cruiser does walk in just from the experience point of view. Um, but Pittenett does the job. He more than doubled Stanley's hit outs, which mm. Stanley's not obviously a recognized top three Ruckman, but still a very good effort for a young bloke, 24 years old. I was just going to say, yeah, and, he, and he held his um, own very well against Gorn, who is arguably the best or second best Ruckman in the comp. Um, after quarter time last week. So very good effort from him two weeks in a row. And even if he is below Cruz in the picking, pecking order, he'd only have to wait, what, two or three games before Cruz is back on the sidelines? So well, what do you can do? Could be even a, a quarter of footy, James, the way uh, Cruz is <laughs> <these days. laughs> Just play two. Play, play two. Yeah, it's probably a safe bet for Keaton. Well, to be fair, Levi Casbolt's a very strong second backup Ruckman, so he did his job well this week as well. Just quickly, Luke, are you so you said before um, last week was a reverse of this week? Yep. Are you admitting that Carlton can only play one half of football in a week? <laughs> it looks like it at this stage. Maybe three quarters of football. But I think the capability is there. They just need to string it together. And Ed Kerno was saying on radio yesterday that Geelong in the late in this game were just saying, don't tackle, don't tackle, don't tackle. They didn't want the ball to be conge uh, contested at all because they wanted to take all the risks to get the pressure back onto Carlton. And it worked for Geelong. But, but I think the Blues ultimately were just good enough to hang on. 
the the question marks are definitely still there if they can hold on to a full game though. Oh yeah. There's nothing but question marks. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, sorry. I'm waiting for one yeah. tick. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was just emphasizing, just in case we're getting ahead of ourselves after that one win, that they're now <laughs> you know, a, con- a contender for the season. It was good to see them getting around Eddie though. Afterwards, singing the song, they were up and about. They haven't sung that song much in the last forty years or so. So it, it was it was great to see that. <laughs> Kudos for Eddie for jumping off Ford Adelaide at just the right time too. It must be said, but we'll get to that. Oh, just a quick mention: Jack Stephen played and looked terrible i don't know if he should have been out there but he just did not look up to the level so hopefully he can get himself back to his best and fairest best soon all right the other saturday night game dodd how did you see the brisbane game yeah just want to start with a quick shout out to uh grant virtual boys played his 250th and a lot of question marks that if he would get there in the last few years the last three years he's only managed eight games at the hawks and been riddled with some serious injuries so it's good to see him up there um, playing for the lions for me, boys, the standout again was Lockie Neal. He, he's flying at the moment and he's probably clear at the top of the Brownlow votes. He would have got three last week, three the week before um, against Frio. And even round one against Hawthorne, he, he was unreal in a loss. So he had two goals, 32 touches, seven tackles, and he's taking his game to another level. If he can maintain this one or two goal per game that he's doing so far, it's just, it's elite stuff from him. But for me, I think the the telling thing for me, boys, was the Eagles. And it's two disappointing weeks in a row. And their midfield is really struggling. Gaff had 30, but have a guess what the next highest possessions were for an Eagles player. Uh, McGovern with one punch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go Tim Kelly with... 19. You said 30. Let's go 25. You'd think that's that's a fair estimate, James, 25. But he, you're right. He, Tim Kelly was the next highest disposal getter, but he had 17. That's a huge drop wow. off from 30 to 17. It's almost 50%. <laughs> <laughs> the James math is back again with the percentages. I'm loving it. But there's a few players, boys. Luke Shuey, Elliot Yo, Kelly as well, Sheed, Jack Redden. They've all been lacking in form the last few weeks and their midfield hasn't looked great, but their forward line as well is not looking balanced without Rioli there. Um, they're looking a bit too tall for mine. And Josh Kennedy, boys, he had five disposals this game, just kicked the one goal. He's turning 33 in a couple of months. He doesn't look great this year. He's not moving around the ground as well as he used to. He's getting tackled quite easily. He's a bit of a worry for mine. And the Eagles have Port Adelaide and Richmond um, in the next two weeks up, up, up in Queensland at the hub. Two big games for the Eagles. They they really struggling up but up there in, in Queensland, and I think they're they're very homesick at the moment. A lot of talk about the hub, and they're not happy up there and stuff like that. But I just think they need to kind of move on, get these wins because it could really turn out well for them if they're going to have all their home games toward the end of the year, which could get them in some serious form. Yeah, I think the Eagles can't wait to get back to Perth. To be honest, I think Adam Simpson's negativity around the hub might be having effect on the club. And it might be one of the reasons why they're playing so poorly. The second he found out that the Eagles had to go to the Gold Coast, he had already started complaining, saying that we don't want to go. Why can't we play in Perth? I think that may have rubbed off on the players. They might not be mentally switched on, not ready to go. So definitely agree that going back to Perth could really boost their chances. One thing the Eagles should be happy about, though, is Nick Natanui. He played great and it's good for the game to see him up and running. And let's hope that he has an injury-free season. Yeah, I agree, Dodds. Nick Nat was good. On the other side of things, though, for Brisbane, Jared Berry continues developing to a brilliant footy player. Kicked three goals, two off a wing this week and looked really dangerous again. So really excited with the way the fruit's progressing through his career too. All that with no Zorko and Stefan Martin, just by the way. Yeah, good stuff from the Lions there. So that's Saturday over and done with. On to Sunday, JD, you've got the first game there. Yes, uh, I'm going to quote someone here. I don't know who it was uh, from last week. They said, who does this game tell us more about, this team or this team? Frankly, <laughs> this game told us more about both teams equally. Uh, Gold Coast, <laughs> I get the very <laughs> real deal. Uh, the very real uh, perception. Let's go with that word. That's a good one. If you can't find one, pick another one. <laughs> um, the Gold Coast are legit. 
they are legitimately up and about. I think we did say there was a bit of a conspiracy with Gold Coast being chosen as one of the hubs, but it has definitely worked in their favor so far. They've got a young, enthusiastic team that is absolutely tearing the shreds off teams at the moment, which then brings us to Adelaide, who frankly uh, have just confirmed, I think, what we have thought from the beginning of the season, I think, maybe. One, they're a bit of a shambles of a club, and now that shambles mentally and behind the scenes has now come to fruition on the field, and they were an absolute mess. And the young brigade of Gold Coasts, and I know we're all frothing at uh, the young Mr. Rao, uh, who is with his tucked-in shirt there, which apparently is getting plenty of air time. Um, they're they're an exciting team to watch. Uh, young King doing his thing. He's going to be a scary, scary prospect in uh, a year or two. He already is, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, no, very solid win. I can't remember the final margin, if I'm honest, but um, it was good. Good win by the Gold Coast. Actually entertaining to watch. 53. That's the margin. It's huge. A couple other, other than the scoreline, a couple other stats that I was thinking that were quite notable and very one-sided in Gold Coast direction. They actually won the clearance of 38 to 25. Huge differential there. They doubled Adelaide's inside 50s, 56 to 28. Tackles inside 50, 17 to 7. And Mark's inside 50, 10 to 2. Now, that Ouch. does not paint a very pretty picture for the Adelaide Football Club, does it? Nope. They got smashed around the park. And this game could have gotten ugly very early. Um, first quarter, the Suns just could not kick a goal. They weren't kicking straight at all. And Adelaide kind of mounted a slight, tiny comeback in the second quarter. But boys, Matty Rao, that left foot goal um, from outside 50, the way Hugh, Hugh Greenwood... Which one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the second one was inside 50, but I'll let that slide, James. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the, the, the left foot... 49. <laughs> <laughs> Centimeter perfect. What's that in percentage format? <laughs> Two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the Suns boys are looking, looking solid. Matty Rao could do the double this year. He's going to win the Rising Star for sure, but... This could be one of those years. It's a weird year, lads. I don't know what the multi is at the moment for Rising Star and Brownlow, but I'd be getting on it. I'd be getting on it, boys, because he's got six votes in the bank. Book it in. Sun's are up and about. I want to disagree with you there, Dodd, but I don't think I can. I can't. I want to say that we're buying into the hype a little bit too early, but the kid is a beast of a unit. And he is. He's just confidence. He's not, he's not even sort of second-guessing himself. He's been great. Mm. And he passes the eye test, definitely. It's not even the stats, not the touches or the goals, but the way he goes about it, the way he attacks the footy is like a Patrick Dangerfield. He just throws himself at it, but he's also classy. Either foot, he can kick from outside 50. He's clean. It's just unreal. I've never seen a player this good this early, and it's scary for the rest of the league, boys. He He's one to watch, definitely. Lots of questions being asked about Adelaide's forward line, but I think their back line needs to be evenly assaulted two weeks in a row. They've looked terrible to me. Daniel Talia is way past it. He hasn't had a good season in a few years, at least Fisher Mackesy has been playing on tolls. He looks terrible. I think their defense really needs to be looked oh, into as third well. Game. True third game, but there needs to be a lot of improvement going on there. I think I'm fearful of a bit of a Carlton five years ago scenario where their, their kids just, keep getting smashed every week and they don't have a chance to develop. So I'm a bit worried about this Adelaide team going forward. All right, so I've got a quick straw poll, just two really quick questions. Number one, is Matty Rowell the best first-year player you would have seen? So far. Yep. So far, yeah. So far. It's only three games, but Walsh, so far. Walsh was pretty good. Chris Judd, maybe yeah. the other one. Oh, sorry, yep. Yeah. I was going to say, more recent times, Rowell versus Walsh, who are you taking? Uh, Raul, but again, three games in. Give us a season. All right. Judge first three games against first three games. Even then, it's hard, Raul, though. Clearly. clearly. Last season, we didn't have a massive break. It's it's so hard to say. How can you, you know, what, you had two months off and you're trying to, you know, Walsh didn't have that. He played back-to-back week to week, you know. So, I don't know. It's still, yeah, still just a fraction too early. That's a th- I'm still going to say Raul, yeah. though. <laughs> That's the thing with these comparisons, like, 
it's not that Walsh wasn't great last year. He was. He was unreal last year. But the way Rouse play these first few games, it's something we haven't really seen before. And that's not a discredit to to who Walsh was last year at all. And I think Walsh, oh, the reason I would take Rao is that I find Walsh a bit more, fraction more of an accumulator rather than an explosive user and scorer. Whereas I think Rao has that side to his game as well. Okay. And the next question I was going to ask was Lockie Weller. So he was talked up a lot um, prior to getting to Gold Coast for what they actually paid for him. So who wins that trade? Does Frio or uh, Gold Coast win that what? trade? So pretty much what happened was... Um, was it pick, again, pick two? Yeah so, yeah. yeah, so he was traded from Frio to Gold Coast um, along with pick 41 for pick two. So pretty much what we're saying is Weller and Ballard or uh, Brayshaw for Frio. Weller mm. who wins and Ballard or Brayshaw to Frere, see is how, that what it was yeah got to see how Brayshaw comes on it's a tough one Lockie Weller showed a lot of promise but he hasn't been consistent enough over the years Brayshaw has shown promise from for Freo too though so I don't know I'm on the fence on this one Ballard might be the swinging vote so maybe it is Gold Coast he's he played real well I'm taking Ballard and Weller and it's actually it's sort of worked in Gold Coast's favor because we, when we heard of that trade, we were thinking, well, that is just ridiculous. What would you do? Pick two for Waller. Like, what is that all about? But now that it's actually come through and there's been a bit of time since then and a bit of games, a few games played, I think Gold Coast win that one personally. Yeah, Ballard was great. And Connor Buderick as well, boys. He kicked a nice goal, but he's solid in defense. He can intercept Mark. He's looking he's looking good as well. And the Suns are building. I'm loving their team. Brandon Ellis um, in this week as well. After winning two flags with the Tigers, um, he seemed pretty up and about to be at the Suns this week. So give him a Friday. Give him the rest of the Friday night games, I'd say. I just want to watch <laughs> Matty Rao every Friday night. I don't know about you boys. My only slight question is, is Gold Coast got off to a ripping start last season as well, I think didn't they? I think they won uh, quite a few of their early games and they dropped off really badly. So they've shown positive signs again, but can they keep it going? Big question coming forward. Did you guys see the uh, Twitter back and forth with uh, Hugh Greenwood and Mark Rusciuto? Yep, and loved it. Yeah, that was great. Mark hasn't had a great week. Rusciuto hasn't had a great uh, couple of weeks, has he? He's uh, He's been hammered on the social medias and you know, look, when he, when he initially um, came out and on the radio, I think it was Triple M in Adelaide, and said all those things about these players that have left, I actually didn't hate it. I didn't mind a bit of the, the brute honesty about it, to be honest. But he looked pretty salty in his responses to Hugh Greenwood. Yeah. Um, when uh, I think Rashido responded with uh, the tweet, all good, mate, enjoy the win. By the way, if you're quicker and younger, you might have gotten more than 10 touches as well. <laughs> And uh, I just think for him, you know, being a big uh, big figure at the Adelaide Crows Football Club, it's not a great look. And I thought Hugh Greenwood uh, finished him on Twitter and took the uh, high road as well um, with, with his final tweet <laughs> saying that it's just a bit of fun on a Sunday night, a bit of cheeky banter. And um, he, he was unreal. He was bursting out of those packs. Uh, I can't believe he's 28 years old. He, he looks flaming 22 the way he's running and moving at the moment. What I found more interesting from that Twitter exchange was Hugh Greenwood's first re- or second reply to Rashudo, where he was saying, I'll quote, what a shock. Someone at the Crows more concerned about disposals than actual impact of, on the game. Who would have thought? <laughs> so that actually paints a picture again about the culture at the Adelaide Football Club. A lot of people have been talking about it. That might be a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it could be true. They did get rid of him because of old and slow, but they have kept Crouch, Sloan, uh, or both Crouchers and Sloan, and they get they get touches, and they're not viewed as important as Hugh Greenwood. Bryce Gibbs must be in a world of strife if he's getting touches and not getting a game at Adelaide. So there's some serious problems going on there. Yeah, I really like that from Hugh. You don't often see um, the players here getting a bit cheeky on the Twitter at uh, some big names like Mark Rusciuto. So I think you're right there, Jim. I think you're right there, Jim. Often a truth is spoken in jest. And so I think there was, while a subtle dig, probably is a fair bit of truth to that matter as far as what they value as a club. Well, if a picture paints a thousand words, I would we'll love to know how many words a tweet paints. <laughs> uh, probably as many that it's uh, have been posted. 
<laughs> what? <laughs> I'm so confused. Yeah, if you type a hundred words, it paints a hundred <laughs> words, is it? <laughs> All right, on to the last game of the round. And there's not really a whole lot to say about this game. A very comfortable win for Port against Fremantle by almost 30 points. Port stay top of the ladder and really a lot of the same stories as last week. The midfield was way too strong. Travis Boak again was excellent. 26 touches, 12 contested and a goal. Ollie Wine slotted back into this midfield seamlessly. He also kicked a goal and had 25 possessions. Another player who was great last week, we'll mention him again. Charlie Dixon's a beast. Took six marks, two goals, two. Crunching packs. Looks really good to watch. If he can keep his body together, he's going to be a force. I'm probably going to say this every week, but he looks really good so far. Yeah, apparently he's get, he got bigger in the offseason. I don't know if you've heard. Bigger and leaner, yes. Um, that photo with him and Chad Corns is is pretty funny, to be honest. It but only gets mentioned every single broadcast, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if you know Pendlebury played basketball, but... No, he actually had um, a basketball background. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen Ben Brown's run-up one? <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we have to have a podcast, What's Overused? <laughs> What's I'm, looking at you, I'm looking at you, Dwayne Russell, with, quote, they're on the canvas. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And what's that other one? Out of all the names we've just mentioned, who um, makes you think of Michael Jordan? <laughs> Connor kind of Well, speaking of overused, the um, the Port Young kids I have spoken about every week, and this week wasn't a great story for them. Xavier Dersma did his hamstring, and he looked in a lot of pain. Connor Rosie was quiet. He also got kicked in the face for good measure, was uh, off the ground getting his jaw checked for a while, but he only had eight touches for the game and couldn't get amongst it. Butters only had nine, so they weren't so good this week. Um, Fife again, as always dominating, similar to Cripps went forward, had a good impact, but wasn't enough for the Dockers in the end. Um, Dodd, your man Walters was really good again. 23 touches, uh, really Walters and Fife were the only standouts for Freer in this game. Again. Good to see Jesse Hogan back playing on a positive note for Freer, mm-hmm. but he just couldn't get involved. He wasn't effective at all. And they play Gold Coast next week at Metricon again. Interesting game. Could show a lot about where these teams really sit. And uh, a quick note on Metricon, that stadium looks like it's really getting chopped up now. I don't know if you guys noticed, but the ground at the end of the week was really breaking up. It got wet and rainy, so it could be one of the downsides to the hub being played there. Could it have been because there was torrential rain and two games played on the same day? Definitely. Definitely a factor for sure. Yeah. I was Okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to see uh, Travis Boak um, having a good season again, boys. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember, but he was moved to the half forward flank a little bit and his career looked like it was going in the wrong direction. But after giving um, up the captaincy last year, he had a really strong 2019. And this year as well, he had a, I think he won the uh, showdown medal, medal last yep. week. And again, this week he was best on ground with 26 touches and a goal. So him doing this at age 31, he's kind of having a second prime of his career. So that's just great to see. And if he's playing well, um, it definitely extends um, Port's potential for this for this season. Yeah, you mentioned Lockie Neal before being probably front runner for the Brownlow. Don't discount Boak either. He's had three really good games and he could have he could be on nine out of nine points so far. So he's one to watch early on also. So Port sitting pretty top of the ladder. They'll definitely be happy with where they are at the moment. And with that done, it's time for Australia's favorite trivia segment, Footy IQ. You all know how it works. The boys go around in a circle to list the answers to a question until all are named or if they get it wrong and the next person gets it right, they'll hear an uh, and they are out. This week, I'm going to change it up a little bit. We're going global here with a nod to the return of the English Premier League on the weekend. No, I'm just We're going to have a look at the... Top goal scorers of the Premier League. We'll keep it with the same year schedule that we normally run with. So the last 20 years gives you 15 options on the board. Plenty of chances there. And we'll go in reverse order to the amount of wins you've got so far. So, Jim, you're up first. Uh, Let's go with Aguero. Aguero, correct. JD, next. Sorry, I'll admit I just phased out for a second. What what are we picking here? (laughs) Top goal scorers of the English Premier League in the last 20 years. Uh, okay. Um, put me down for uh, 20 years. Uh, Peter Crouch. <laughs> uh, straight off the bat, John. No <laughs> dice, I'm sorry. JD's gone. Dodzy, can you knock JD out straight up early? Uh, 100%. <laughs> and I'm going to do it with the lad you love, Luca. Harry yes. 
Sorry, John. <laughs> you uh, JD, might have to rip that contract up go, again, mate. I was going to go John Franco Zola, but it <laughs> might be 99. If you did the uh, leading scorers from the last 40 years, JD might have had a chance. <laughs> oh, pants, would have had your pants. <laughs> All right. Jim, you've had plenty of time to think about this. Who's your man? Um, oh, let's go again recent. Let's go Mane. He's correct. Equal winner last year. Back to you, Dots. Well, that was close. <laughs> Um, we'll go Salah from Liverpool. Salah was also one of the equal winners last year and has won it the year before that. Going back to my old Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports 2 days, let's go with Robin Van Persie. Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> back to back, 2012, 2013, correct. Just quick, did he win it both with Arsenal and Man U? I can tell you he won it with both Arsenal and Man U in back to back seasons, yep. Not a bad effort. Good effort, very good effort. Dodzy? You stole my pick, James, but it also reminded me of the glory days of Man United, so I'm going to pick Carlos Tevez next. <laughs> that is correct. 2011. Jim? Mm, pointy end. Can I just say, Tevez won it at City, not at United, but it still counts. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said Manchester there. Um, oh, JD. <laughs> look, I, go, I do go for the Blues. Chelsea. Drogba? He did win a one year thing. Yeah. He did. He won it two years, actually. 2007 and 2010. What well a thoughts. This is easy. James is just uh, helping me out here. Nicholas and Elka. He won it one year, I think. Oh, what a man. <laughs> oh. He did. 2009. As I'm sitting here on the sidelines, it's all actually coming back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Takes you a while to unlock that memory there, John. Yeah. Find the key. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's, once I got my medication. <laughs> We're doing better with the EPL uh, trivia than playing footy. The last oh, no, this minutes. is disappointing. <laughs> Carry on, Jim. <laughs> That's actually true for my case anyway. Um, uh, let's go. What about Chomp? Chompity Chomp Chomps. Not TJ, but Louis. Suarez. Suarez. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm thinking Stevie Johnson here. Uh, Suarez did win it. I'm sorry. Uh, 2014. Correct. Tick. Dodd. Uh, we'll go with the best player of all time, Cristiano Ronaldo. Ronaldo won once. Sorry, Messi. 2008. <laughs> I can tell you we have one, two, three, four, five names left. Oh, wow. Jeez. So 10 out of 15 done. Good job, oh, boys. Um, Obama Yang. Obama Yang, correct. Pierre. Last year, one of the three equal winners. What a, what a Pierre. What's, um, are we looking at some pretty early years now? Or was that too much of a clue? Yeah, we got 2000, well, pretty much everywhere from 2001 to 2006 and then 2011. I think I've got one more in the bank left and then I am yeah. done. <laughs> I'm going to go with a safe one here from the old days. I'm going to go um, Thierry Henry. Mm. Correct. That knocks off four of the four of those seasons. Four. Wow. He won four. 2002, 2004, 2005, 2006. Jim, you got three names left. Uh, it's up to me, isn't it? Um. I'm actually, I've actually, I, I know the answer because I've actually got a funny story. I'll say it if time permits. Um, so on Instagram recently, there's this thing, I can't remember the exact profile name, but it's uh, like something about becoming a fantasy football scout, but for an actual club, you pay them 800 bucks for a course and you become a fully qualified scout. And one of their guest speakers is um, they claimed to be Rude Van Nistelrooy's brother. Mm, and they no. said brother of <laughs> golden boot winner Rude Van Nistroy. I think he's actually Frank. <laughs> so I'm going to say <laughs> Rude Van Nistroy. That is correct. 2003. So two names left. Yes. I knew the spam would come in handy one day. Two names left. I love that. It's only 800 pounds. May as well do it. That's a good shout out to all the uh, football manager and championship manager players from back in the day. I've got one name that I'm going to throw out there, but I don't think you won it. But we're talking about United Strikers. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm going to go Berbatov. He, he was close, definitely, oh. but I don't think he got it. What a legend. What oh, a legend he, he is. He tied with Carlos Tevez, would you believe? <laughs> so, correct. Oh, Timothy Berbatov, man. which leaves one name on the board, James. And it is the oldest name available to us, 2000 and, 2001 season. Jesus. 2001. 2001. Do you want to know which club he played for? Oh, he's got it. Yeah, he's got it in the club. No, 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 hang on. I don't think I need the clue because I think... Your eyes lit up. You know what I just remembered? 
remember watching my favorite movie as a kid. I bet you can all guess what it was. Soccer related. Toy Story 1. Soccer related. Goal. 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 And what club does he play for? Santiago Munez. What club does Munez play for? Played for Newcastle, Newcastle. Newcastle, didn't he? And who did he see doing Ooh. about 300 pounds on the leg press? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the great man, Alan Shearer. Look, Alan Shearer won it, but not after the year 2000. Oh, oh you're kidding. Oh. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. <clears throat> However, you're still in with a shot here. Dodsy, your turn to have a crack to claim the win. What year did he win it? This is 2000. Uh, Shearer won it no, three 90. times, actually. 94, 95, 95, 96, and 96, 97. Oh. Oh, man. I- Great, great My favourite right. part of the weekend is seeing Alan Shearer's team of the week. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is this name will will spark everyone's ears when you hear it. He's a two time winner. Oh. He won at ninety eight and ninety nine, and then he won the year two thousand two thousand and one, which is the one we're trying to get now. I think you may have given me a clue there, Luke. But I still think I'm wrong. But let's go with Michael Owen. Oh. Very close to Michael Owen, another two-time winner. Oh, 97, shit. 98, 98, 99. No way. Oh. <laughs> Just missed out. Who would have now, guessed I... that the best version of footy IQ would have been about not <laughs> AFL footy, <laughs> but English footy? <laughs> so here comes the clue. I'll tell you the club he played for, which it might give it away for you considering it's your turn, James, but he was a Chelsea striker. Chelsea Let's striker? Draw. Do we have a year? <laughs> Told you, you know the year 2000, 2001. Oh, 2001. It's not Zola, is it? Like JD said. It is oh, not okay. Zola. Oh, who would it be then? It is not Zola. Um, I think we might be out of guesses here. Anyone have any guesses? Andre Shushenko. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, <laughs> what he a is gun. the greatest player what a superstar. of all time. He was so good, yeah. Unfortunately, that's not the one. Are we giving up? Yeah, uh, I don't I, think I can I, get it. I yeah. can't get it. I don't know who it is. All right. It's not Roman Abramovich. <laughs> Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank oh, Hassel. was the last name we oh. had on the list. Absolute superstar. Two-time winner. He won one at Leeds as well. But oh, and the Hoff, the Hasselhoff. Unfortunately, no winners this week in what was a pretty successful English Premier League expedition. Well, well done, Jim. Oh, hello. <laughs> that was a pleasure going back and forth with you, mate, over EPL. Not the first time, is it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to keep this pod PG rated sometimes. So. All right. So that's us for another week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll be back next week with more stories from footy and hopefully some clarity on some Essendon football. As always, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at No Sweat Podcast. You can follow me at Looker on Sport. You can follow Jim's work at Top 4 next year. Thank you, Jim, Dodd, JD. We've been No Sweat. We'll see you next week.